words, uh, a couple words for Jamie. Don't mourn, organize. Okay. Uh, I would like to thank our uh, departmental administrator. Catherine, are you here? Where are you? Please step out. Leslie Rocher, where are you? Our program manager. There she is. Uh, these are uh, two individuals that have carried the load. We don't see them. Uh, they're doing everything uh, to make it all happen. So thank you. I have two quick other comments. One, uh, my, my dear friend uh, Alicia Blair from long ago, 1988, uh, uh, graduating class, uh, had, was uh, very kind but also a little devilish in sending her son to visit with me three years ago. Uh, I was sitting in my office and I had a little knock on the door, and the professor Bauer, I said, yes, uh, how can I help you? He said, my name is Max. I'm Alicia Lear's son, and I'm a freshman at Columbus. <laughs> so, uh, he's now a senior, uh, but it, it did remind me uh, that I'd been around for a while. In the, in the, in the planning for this event, um, it, it's difficult perhaps to describe. Um, we have a number of individuals who have made it back to visit with us. It's been wonderful. Uh, but there are so many others that aren't here. And one thing that became apparent to me is the scale of what the department has produced in its 35 years. I don't know, it must be 400 and some majors. There's, you know, an ample number of minors and then a host of students that are in the urban studies and environmental science uh, program. And then there are also many others that have maintained uh, contact with me after taking me introductory environmental science class that have gone on to do things that are related to the environment. And the, the, the nature of the work is it's environmental lawyering, it's uh, leaders in all kinds of various movements, uh, in government uh, and so forth. Uh, it really is impressive. That's really what I wanted to say. <laughs> So uh, we have uh, Janine Cancus. Um, she uh, graduated in 1991. Uh, I know that she is a recent author. She'll tell you uh, about it. But I know before that that she worked at the EPA uh, for at least 10 years. Longer? Um, EPA? Yeah, about 10 years. About 10 years. OK. Go. OK. <laughs> well, again, I'm Janine Tankus, AKA Green Janine. And um, I majored in psychology, I minored in environmental science. And my having studied these two disciplines has been very useful to me uh, because an integral part of really everything I've done has been communicating environmental science issues to the public and trying to influence people to change their behaviors. Professor Bauer asked me to talk about my career path, and while I do that, I'll highlight some different examples of different types of communication approaches that I've used. My first job was at EPA, Environmental Protection Agency, in the New York City office. I was there actually, I think, eight years, and I held three different positions. In my first job, I was a solid waste management specialist, and it was actually a paper I wrote for a class with Peter my senior year that not only got me interested in the topic but helped me to get that first job because in writing the paper in my research, it was about solid waste management, I learned about EPA's roles and positions and it was demonstrating that I had that knowledge in my interview at EPA that really helped me to stand out from among the other candidates. And in that job, I primarily was a liaison to Puerto Rico and the US Virgin Islands in managing their solid waste. I did that for four years, and then I took a role, a, a job in the policy and planning branch, where in that position, I was able to work on a variety of EPA programs, and I was able to become more knowledgeable on a broader range of environmental issues. And in that role, I coordinated EPA Region 2's first State of the, Envir excuse me, State of the Environment report, which was a report that was geared to the public, and communicated major issues and data in simple language and colorful graphics. And in my final position, oh, I think, how do we, okay, I'm sorry. In, my, in um, my final position at EPA, I worked 
as a public relations specialist in the Superfund program. And then I went to work for the New York City Department of Environmental Protection. And I worked in a community planning office. And I worked with local planners and the public to protect the watershed of the New York City water supply. And this is an example of a project I enjoyed working on there, where this is a park that is uh, very, very popular in the area. It's below the Kensico Dam. And I put in three signs to be a permanent educational display. And the first sign explained the history of the dam. The second sign explained what is a watershed. And the third explained to residents what it is that they could do to try to protect the water supply. And a sign like this has to have eye-catching graphics to attract people to look and use as few words as possible because most people won't stop for long. And during my time at EPA and at DEP, I went to school at night to get a master's in biology specializing in ecology. I did that at Fordham University. And also during that time, I was um, a docent at the Bronx Zoo where I worked in their Department of Education as a volunteer teacher. Then I moved to Fort Worth, Texas, where um, my husband had a job offer, and we just decided to move there. And there weren't as many opportunities in environmental science, so I decided to pursue another love of mine, which was photography. And I had a small portrait photography business while we were there. Then after six years, we moved back east to New Jersey, where I am now. And I chose to focus on volunteer work in the environmental field because it allowed me more flexibility as I had two small children. And I became the chair of the environmental commission of my town. And I'm also on the board of trustees of ANJEC, which is a nonprofit organization that helps to support the environmental commissions throughout the state of New Jersey. My environmental commission reviews environmental impact statements for all the development in my town, but also conducts a lot of different types of environmental um, education projects. And here's an example of a fun project that I just very much enjoyed working on. Um, it is a traveling display that I created with an elementary school. And that sculpture is made out of 365 empty water bottles that the kids collected from their cafeteria. And what, with having the sculpture like this, the idea is that people are attracted to come over and see the sculpture because of its size and it looks different. And then once they're there, they see information on the label, which um, I don't know if you can really read it. It's kind of small up at the top, but it's basic information about the problems associated with disposable water bottles. And then for people who are inclined to read a little further, we had this banner that has much more detailed information on the environmental issues that goes along with the bottle. I'm extremely excited about a project um, I'm working on right now that we're calling the Eco Patio. And this is an area that's going, that, well, it's in a, a recreation center in my town that gets tons of foot traffic. Um, literally tens of thousands of people will pass by here each year. And it's going to be a spot that will teach about a variety of environmental issues. And we are painting murals on the buildings that are there and putting in this patio to help draw people to the area. And then once there, there will be educational signage that teaches them about a variety of things. And they will see there a monarch way station, a rain garden. The pavers are permeable pavers, so they'll learn about non-point source water pollution. And the benches are made, um, all the seating will be made from recycled plastic. I have two sons. They are 12 and 15 years old. And my 12-year-old son has always had a particular interest in being green. So he and I published a book together called Let's Go Green Together. And our goal with that book is to empower kids to take action and inspire people of all ages to go green. I'm really very surprised that 25, it's more than 25 years since I started working at EPA. And I so often still see the same problems that we saw back then, like people idling in their cars, low recycling rates, so much waste. And so we took a, we created the book taking a different approach. And the, the project combines my backgrounds in environmental education and photography. 
So over a few years, I took photographs of my son taking green actions. And our book is illustrated with the photos to clearly demonstrate for children what they can do. There are lots of great books that are building awareness, but I found that they often direct children to do things that as children they can't do yet. So, uh, for example, things like turning down the thermostat. And we focused on things that kids can really do. We made the photos whimsical and we wrote silly captions to help keep the book engaging. So just a, a few examples up here. There's um, one picture where I show you a whole page and that's showing that um, my son's name is Aaron. Aaron has a recycling bin in his own bedroom and it's an action shot and it says, bye bye paper. I hope you get turned into something good like a candy wrapper or a baseball card. And then the square picture at the top is from a section called Only Take What You Need. And it's preceded by a picture that has the caption, One paper towel is enough for me. And this picture has the caption, Those are enough paper towels to dry an elephant. And the picture with the butterfly on his face says, Love nature and it will love you back. Now that picture with the monarch butterfly actually ended up in the book because he and I also raise monarch butterflies and we teach about that. Um, that's another interesting thing, but we don't have enough time to get into that. So I wanna let you know that on my website there is some information about that and of course you can ask me about it as well. I also wanna mention that the book encourages kids to play outside and connect with nature because without that they will never care enough really to go green. And I wanted this book to follow one child so the reader would see one kid incorporating all these actions into their daily life and relate to that child. It's written in the first person in Aaron's voice. So it's a real kid showing you what he does for the environment. And in the book, we also um, visit some friends. And this is um, on the left, there's a picture from, I'm sorry, a page out of that part of the book because we really wanted to tie in, of course, the important message of collective impact. So we do that there. And we included a list of discussion questions to encourage parents and teachers to have conversations with their children about nature and about green lifestyle. And there's a green award that you can see up here. I'm not sure why it's showing in black. Something happened to it, so it's a little hard to see. But it's, um, it's there as an activity to fill out, but also to hang up to remind the kids to take action and do green things. And in the back of the book, we also have a chapter, um, that part I wrote, which is more detail about why taking all the actions matters, a little more real environmental science nuts, nuts and bolts. And that's written at a level for older children to understand, but it was really aimed at the parents and the teachers. And I wanted to share that we're very excited about the feedback that we're getting. For example, there are teachers who have told me that after reading the book with their class, that days later, kids are coming in and they're saying excitedly, talking about things that they do at home, that they saw Aaron do in the book, and that was exactly what we had hoped for. Now we need to work on marketing the book, and, uh, because we just published it this summer, and my son and I are working on a video trailer for the book. Um, and I, I just want to point out in closing that with this book and the other projects that I've shared, you may have noticed that there are some very simple common themes. You need to identify who your audience is. You need to catch people's attention in some way. And then you need to keep the message as brief as possible, um, but also keep things as visually appealing as you can. And I also want to add to that that you I try to keep the message as positive I can because it was actually a class at Barnard that taught me that if the message is too negative or too scary, that generally people don't listen. And um, I also want to thank Professor Bauer because he set me off on this path that has really given me a tremendous amount of joy and fulfillment in my life. So thank you, Peter. And thank you, everybody. Are we going to Skype? Uh, I was on the phone. Pardon me? She's there. She's on there? Oh, good, good. Uh, Maggie Dressel and I were on the phone last night. Uh, she's very sick, very, uh, you're probably more upset that she can't make it here today, but thank you, Martin, and thank you, Leslie, for arranging 
our little Skype session. Okay. Thank you. Hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so sad, like Peter said, not to be there in person with you guys today. But uh, I'm battling about a hundred degree fever and strep throat and a cough. Basically, my immune system has given up on me. So thank you for um, allowing me to join you virtually. Um, and thank you, Peter, for the opportunity to share a little bit about my career path with everyone today um, and how you and Barnard have kind of shaped shaped my life so far. Um, Sorry to interrupt you. Can you go a little bit closer to the, wherever the microphone is? Not yes. to forget about the video, better? just the microphone. Is that better? We'll see. Cool. Um, so I was an urban studies major, um, and I concentrated in education within that. And then I minored in environmental science. And I never intended to minor in science. Um, I was never kind of one of, I, I enjoyed being outside as a kid, but I was always told, you're a good writer, you, you know, maybe you'll be an English major, maybe you'll be a teacher. I was never really encouraged to explore the sciences. Um, then I took Professor Bauer's Intro to Environmental Science class my sophomore year, and uh, the rest is history. I fell in love with learning not just about the environment, but the impact that, both positive and negative, that um, humans can have on the environment. So the pictures you're seeing on the slides right now um, are from the fellowship that I did with the Parks Department in New York City the summer after my graduation um, from Barnard. And I was stationed in the South Bronx at Cortona Park, and it was a really wonderful um, opportunity to kind of get to engage with the community there. Um, Honestly, the community there, they used the park mostly for barbecues on the weekends, and they just kind of saw the park as a place to come together and gather with family. And so as a park ranger, it was our job to, you know, help them enjoy those experiences, but then also uh, show them all the, the interesting opportunities that the park itself um, could, could offer them. And so in the top photo, you can see the kids loved oftentimes doing arts and crafts projects, but uh, we could work in a little bit of the science and education by doing some leaf identification. Um, we also had a beautiful lake in the middle of the park, so um, we would take them canoeing and fishing, and the kids loved kind of doing those fun activities, but uh, we kind of tried to work in any of the educational component when, whenever possible. And then in the, the next slide, um, if you look perfect, um, my first real job after college was at a small nonprofit called Solar Youth um, in New Haven, Connecticut. And uh, it really showed me what a small, small world it is because the founder of Solar Youth was actually another Barnard grad, um, Joanne Scully. She was class of 92. And uh, Professor Bauer was actually an advisor back in the early 90s. So um, it was great to you know, kind of taken under the wing of another strong, beautiful Barnard woman right after graduation. Um, at Solar Youth, we were doing after-school um, steward team type programs that were focused on leadership development, but also kind of environmental science and education. <clears throat> um, and the first steward team session I had, I was so excited. I had planned a lesson all about ecosystems, and you know, I had all my materials ready. I was so excited. Three o'clock rolled around. I opened the door, and no one showed up. Um, and it was really sad. And I realized that you know, I had to kind of meet the kids where they were. Um, Solar Youth was um, based out of a public housing development in New Haven, and the kids were on their own to kind of make a lot of their own decisions. And oftentimes they didn't want to go to a place to, to learn, quite honestly. They wanted to go have fun. It was after school. They wanted to be outside. And so um, as sad as that, as disappointing as that first session was, it really opened my eyes to, you know, yes, science is not easy to get across. You have to present it in a way that resonates with, um, with the audience that you're going for. So um, 
I worked really hard to kind of find connections um, with the kids, see what they were excited about, and um, then kind of go from there. I had one group of kids, one session, that they were really interested in animals and adaptations. And so we designed a, like a three-month unit all about adaptations, and they just took it and ran with it, and we got to dive kind of deep into that. And so, <clears throat> sorry, another thing that the kids at Solar Youth were really interested in were um, creating positive change in their communities. Um, so as you can see, some of the photos, we would often end up doing litter cleanups or you know, removing some of the larger dumped um, items from the creek behind the, the projects. Um, and they, they hadn't ever really been given a chance to kind of be that positive change in their communities. And, and they really loved it, you know, even teaching about something as easy as um, litter, you know, why you shouldn't litter. Then they would run home and tell the rest of their family members, we learned this at Solar Youth today, and mom and dad, you shouldn't litter either. And so I started kind of seeing, you know, how, how giving kids the opportunity to become agents of change in their own communities could really have um, a really um, integral and solid impact in their lives. Um, and then in the next slide, um, after Solar Youth, I moved back to the Washington, D.C. area where I am from and worked at two organizations. Um, the Center for Health, Environment, and Justice um, was founded by Lois Gibbs um, of, kind of Love Canal Infamy in New York. And I definitely learned a lot more about the, the hard science side of things with them and all the toxicology and um, uh, CHEJ was really focused on um, helping communities who are facing um, environmental um, hazards and health impacts in their in their lives. So um, I definitely learned there how to share all the important work that CHEJ was doing in a in kind of a lay person friendly way because I don't really understand all the hard science um, and I had to present it in a way that was manageable to um, other folks so they would be be interested and, and want to listen and learn more. Um, and then at Conservation International, um, they their marketing is, is down to a science over there. They always stress how, you know, nature doesn't need us, but people need nature to thrive. And so it definitely reinforced that, you know, you really need to find um, that connection to, to people's own lives and experiences in order to get them to really engage around these subjects. Um, which brings me to my final slide um, and where I am today um, with the Future City Competition. <coughs> my apologies. Um, so Future City, it is a STEM competition program for middle school students. And it has really brought my garnered experience full circle. It combines my urban studies background, my education background, and the environmental and sustainability aspect as well. Um, future City challenges middle school students to imagine, design, and create cities of the future. Um, and it's an engineering-focused competition, um, though we focus on all the you know, STEM subjects, but engineering is the heart of Future City. And engineering, it, it can be kind of scary to both kids and uh, teachers who don't feel maybe as comfortable with engineering as they do with traditional science or math. And so we have to present it in a way that um, shares kind of what engineers do at the most basic level. So they solve problems. Engineers make the world a better place. And so during the, the times of the competition, the kids uh, spend about four to five months um, researching everything that goes into um, planning and managing a city and then um, we give them a specific theme each year to focus their research around. So in past years, it's been solid waste or urban agriculture or stormwater or sustainable, um, sustainable transportation. Um, and it really, um, you know, for 81% of our kids, it's their first experience with engineering. And uh, it's such an important age at the middle school level because, um, you know, that's what I was told. Oh, girls don't do, you know, science. Girls don't do engineering. Um, but you really need to get them um, before, they're, before the world tells them that. And uh, the two teams that you see on the, the slide up there, 
Um, they're showing off the cities that they designed and they actually build models of their cities out of recycled materials. Um, and they learn so much, but what I really, uh, really appreciate about Future City is that, um, you know, it takes all the knowledge that they've gained and the kids can actually start applying it um, to their own lives and impacting their own lives and communities. Uh, right now, we've had kids that have met with researchers at the Mayo Clinic to talk about public spaces and how they can um, design the public space to benefit everyone. Um, kids who met with a hotel chain developer because they wanted to make sure that the hotel chain was going to incorporate um, sustainable waste management procedures. And so um, it's really encouraging to see kind of the, the impact that, you know, kind of getting these scientific concepts across to, to kids can have. Um, and yeah, science definitely isn't always easy to get across, but I found that if you make it relevant to their lives, if you make it authentic, and if you give them um, kind of an opportunity to meaningfully engage with, um, you know, the scientific concepts around them, that that is so important and it gets them really, really jazzed about, you know, not just learning now, but can set their course for the future, just like uh, Professor Bauer and Barnard did for me. So thank you so much uh, for having, having me here virtually today. Feel better soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> <laughs> So we have Ekaterina Alexandrova, who is the director of the Board of Relations of the, at the Nature Conservancy, one of my favorite groups. Thank you, Peter. Thanks very much for coming. And I was really pleased to hear uh, so many shout outs on the previous panel for interdisciplinary careers because my career has definitely been interdisciplinary and it all started here at Barnard with a Bachelor of Arts degree with the seven ways of knowing and all of the literature classes we had to take and the language classes and a study abroad in Paris. But at the same time, I did some significant studies uh, with Brian Mayu on microbiology and arsenic research, which was pretty significant for uh, undergraduate education. And so after college, I worked for a number of organizations, um, first starting out as an environmental consultant for radioactive waste management company. Um, then I moved uh, for several years to Central America and Mexico and worked with several um, nonprofits working on land use and uh, re um, deforestation um, measures, Red Plus, if anybody is familiar with the carbon lingo. Um, I ended up getting another interdisciplinary degree in uh, conservation leadership from Colorado State University and eventually ended up at the Nature Conservancy working for the CEO. Um, in my first position for the CEO, I spent two years preparing briefs for all of his meetings and engagements. So every single week he received a book of about 200 pages from me in electronic format, uh, where he had a brief for every single phone call, panel, meeting, uh, presentation that he had to do that week. Um, and the last two years I've been managing the board of directors program. Uh, the board of directors for the Nature Conservancy is a governing board, so they have fiduciary and legal responsibilities for the organization. But at the same time, they're extremely engaged and really want to comment and advice and help with the conservation strategy. So in reflecting back on my career with the question of what are some of the innovative ways of communicating, um, I would say that I've come to a realization that in the environmental and the conservation fields, we the, the principles of environment and everything we're trying to promote are becoming more commonplace in the society. But still, for the most part, we're often communicating and trying to engage with people who fundamentally don't understand the concepts that we're trying to connect upon. So if I had to give two lessons for 
how to communicate and bridge the gap between zero to fundamentals to try to begin the conversation you're trying to begin is one is to be simple and two is show it rather than tell it. And that principle has been proven to me in a number of moments and points in my career, but I'm going to tell you two stories to highlight what I'm saying. Um, the first one is from when I worked with a small organization in the south of Belize um, in the Caribbean. Uh, the organization was a very small local nonprofit that focused on connectivity of the rainforest between the Maya Mountains of southern Belize and the Bay of Honduras, uh, which connects to the Caribbean Sea. So there are a number of approaches that we used. We had a couple of protected areas that we managed. We worked with the national government to implement particular uh, regulations and programs for the country overall, but most importantly, we worked with the communities around the protected areas that were the core centers of the forest we were trying to protect. And those communities um, have, were living in a very, very um, basic way, using the resources that were surrounding them. So a lot of that work was basic on a fundamental level. Uh, most of what the people in the communities did was subsistence farming and uh, some cash crop raising, um, but very few. So part of the work was to work with farmers on their practices, but a lot of the work had to do with basic environmental education. So that education involved kids who uh, lived in those communities, and it also involved their moms who were often uh, not educated at all. Uh, the so south of Belize became connected to the rest of the country only several years before I got there. So even Belizeans from up north thought of that part of the world as so far and remote that it might as well not exist. So uh, the communities uh, were all based around rivers. It was a pretty, pretty massive watershed with a ton of rainfall, and all of the rivers would empty out into the Bay of Honduras. So one very simple problem was the rise of pollution from plastics that were coming into the communities all of a sudden. So a very basic idea of if you put something in the river, it's going to end up somewhere was not understandable to somebody who doesn't know where the river goes and how the watershed is connected to anything else. If you put something in the river, it goes away and you never see it again. And so the idea, once we realized that some people actually don't know where the river goes, because even though they live 20 miles away from the Caribbean Sea, they've never seen the sea, was really eye-opening. So. What we ended up doing was getting some funding to run programs for local schools where we would take kids. It was focused on kids and their moms uh, because women often didn't leave the communities um, uh, there. So we held these field trips where we would take people on the boat, down the river, into the Bay of Honduras, and then we would take kids snorkeling. And the, the, the idea seems very simple, even describing it, but in reality, as if it's a concept that you so fundamentally don't understand, that's really the only, the simplest and the most straightforward way to explain to somebody the connectivity of watershed and rivers and the sea. Um, so that's one example, and I really don't want to make it about, oh, it's a community that didn't have a lot of education, was really isolated, because that same principle applies to other places as well. So my other example is from my current role in managing the board of directors at the Nature Conservancy. It's a board of 25 people who are all extremely accomplished, very educated. They're all former CEOs of major companies all over the world. And as I mentioned, um, they are very involved with our conservation strategy. But of course, on a lot of the topics that they advise upon, they may or may not have a particular background. So a lot of the time, what they advise on is the principles. So you have this idea 
what's the best way to scale it globally and do it quickly and do it effectively and efficiently. So about a year ago, our board chair at the time had asked me to put together a session on soil health and what the Nature Conservancy is doing to reduce nutrient uh, emissions into watersheds in North America. But in order to build that kind of a conversation, you have to start from the basics. Because we're talking to a room of people who may all be very accomplished and understanding, but they are not soil scientists. Um, so in order to be able to engage on that topic, you have to explain what is soil, <laughs> what is it made of, uh, what are the thousands of different types of soils that exist, and uh, what are some of the agricultural practices that can reduce impact on soil erosion and improve the soil quality, and what are some of the simple uh, solutions that we have, and then translate that into a conversation of, how do we scale it at a national level? So in order to begin that discussion, we set up a lab. Um, I invited some of our uh, soil scientists and agriculture practitioners from uh, the Midwestern states, and we actually set up a lab that you would for middle school students. We had actual soil samples. We had soil course in order to show the stratification. Uh, we had maps of thousands of different types of soils all over the country in order to explain enough fundamentals that we can then have a meaningful conversation. So, I'm going <laughs> so, so in, in, in these two examples, it, it really is about simplicity and focus of what it is that you want to connect on and discuss. And two, showing is always more straightforward than telling if your aim is to start from zero and get to a point of the conversation. So I'm looking forward to hearing your ideas and questions on this and, and challenges. <laughs> Thank you. We have Carly Wertheim. Um, she's a natural food chef and a, I love this, culinary wellness educator. <laughs> yes. All right. All right. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much to the department for having me back. I graduated in 2014. And um, so not a lot of time has passed. And it's just always so refreshing to be back on campus and such a warm space. So I think like many of the people who decide to study environmental science, I chose this major because I truly care very deeply about the natural world. I came to Barnard and I just wanted to throw myself into really understanding all of these dynamic processes of our Earth systems. And um, I wanted to find a way that as a human living in the 21st century, that maybe I could live in balance um, with all of the other plants and animals and fungi that we share this place with. So what happened is that during my time at Barnard, I discovered this triad of passions. That at the time in college were really competing for um, my time and my focus, but that over the years have come to create um, this incredible business for myself. So I'm a little bit different from some of the other panelists in that um, I have my own business, Carly's Wellness Kitchen, which is on the first slide. But so here I have some things that I like to do during college. Um, these were things I knew about myself. Uh, that from my study um, of the Earth systems, I really focused in on food. Um, I spent some time at this organic farm in Ecuador, those are the bottom two pictures, uh, that just rocked my worldview. All of a sudden, food became this epicenter through which all of these other environmental and social issues could radiate out from. And I came back from that farm completely transformed. So the second is that I grew up in this family where food was part of the culture. Uh, I come from a line of butchers, literally. Um, and so nightly family dinners and being in the kitchen coming together around our shared cultural foods was just a part of my every day. And so suddenly I was in college without those family traditions and I wanted to recreate them for myself here. 
So I was playing around at the kitchen, all of these um, produ produce uh, that I was you know, growing out in the garden, um, I wanted to create with. So I was hearing the calling of the kitchen and answering it. And then the third is that during my time at Barnard, I um, came across some personal health challenges that I had to take some time off actually to address. And what that time did is it made me really reevaluate the way that I was nourishing my body. And I had to ask myself some really interesting questions about what was the link between diet and health and what role was food playing um, with some of the symptoms that I was struggling with. So here I was at Barnard, an environmental science student, taking absolutely every single course that had um, the word food in it, which there were no many, um, but I was taking them. I was then all of a sudden enrolling in all these pre-med courses because I wanted to give myself the opportunity to study nutrition um, after college. And I was cooking. I was cooking for myself. I was cooking for my friends, my family, whenever I could. So jump forward five years. And I actually have found a way to combine all of these passions into a career for myself. Um, I am a culinary nutritionist, so talk about translating. I am translating the science of nutrition onto the plate, into actual food that people eat. So while I was a senior here at Barnard, um, I started my business, Carly's Wellness Kitchen, out of my uh, the senior thesis project for the environmental, or excuse me, for the Athena Scholars Program. Um, we got to design and implement our own projects, and I created one where I started doing food and nutrition education for cancer patients at Mount Sinai Roosevelt Hospital. And it really just seemed at the time like I couldn't find a job that wanted, that kind of combined all the things that I was interested in, so I decided to make one up for myself. And today I work with individuals um, who are looking to live more healthfully, people who want to feel more vibrant, people who have chronic illness um, or acute illnesses that they're dealing with, who are looking to really use food as a tool in their treatment plans. So I teach these people. Um, I show them how to go grocery shopping for themselves, how to go to the farmer's market and pick out produce that's ripe. I work with them in the kitchen and I give them culinary skills, hoping that they build their confidence in the kitchen so that turning that food into dishes that they can eat doesn't seem so intimidating. Um, I teach uh, kids at an elementary school in Brooklyn and I work as a personal chef for others who are unable to cook for themselves and I create food that's really targeted to their specific and unique health challenges. And it's awesome because I absolutely love my work. So how do I see myself as a com innovative communicator. So I view food and nutrition, really, as a direct link out into the natural world, as a way that we as consumers can vote with our forks three times a day for all of these sustainable food practices that we care deeply about. I actually believe that by consuming a carrot grown in your local regional food shed, it makes you a little bit closer to that land. And food and nutrition is also this way to strengthen the bonds to the earth and live in a way that replenishes rather than depletes our planet. So I communicate through food, through food experiences. Um, I create these different flavors and textures and create colors that people are attracted to, that they want to engage in. Food becomes this experience, a shared experience that everyone can relate to. I communicate through the flavors of a celery root, of a parsnip, of a butternut squash. Um, I communicate through talking about all the amazing benefits of spring vegetables, those bitter leafy greens when they come popping up through the earth. Um, and I really truly believe that our health is very intertwined with the health of the planet, and for us to be truly healthy, our, sustain, our ecosystems need to be healthy as well. So I'm communicating by telling people how to compost, um, how to save their veggie scraps for a veggie scrap stock, um, how to build our local regional food sheds by creating a consumer base for those farmers. And this is all the different ways that I'm sharing my message about nourishment. So here are a couple different other examples. It's all about color. People are attracted to color. You know, it's naturally instinctual. And um, the big thing, I think, with the innovative communication approaches is that people have to taste 
and they have to use all of their senses to feel engaged. So very much like your message of the showing and not telling, it's getting people to really have sensory experiences. And so I'll end um, with, those are some of the, gosh, social media, got to keep up with it. <laughs> but I'll end with this. Um, my favorite day of the week is Friday, and not just because it's uh, close to the weekend, but it's the day that I get to work with the young chefs at PS118 over in Brooklyn. And on Fridays, we go out into the garden together. Uh, we harvest whatever has been growing. Um, it's a lot of like cauliflower and Swiss chard, tons of herbs these days. And we use it back in the kitchen to create gorgeous plant-based meals. So last week, I brought in a total rainbow of vegetables. We had everything from red bell pepper to a purple cabbage, and we made um, what I called rainbow udon stir fry. So I had this girl who's like, I do not eat mushrooms. I'm allergic to them. I'm like, the nurse did not tell me that. You're eating them. Um, I had another kid who tried the radish while it was still really bitter and uncooked and actually ran over to the trash to spit it out. So, I work with kindergartners through fourth graders. We're told all the time, like, kids don't eat vegetables. You know, that's why you have the kid menu. But when you give a child the opportunity to see how the vegetable is grown, to really get involved in that experience of creation um, and empowering them to play around in the kitchen to create flavors that they're drawn to, it's pretty incredible what a kid will eat. Um, that same, I, you know, actually everyone, you know, had cleared plates at the end of the day. Um, not a vegetable was left untouched. So that's what really inspires me, is just knowing that um, we can cultivate this next generation of eaters. And all of those kids are going to grow up to be adults who are going to be purchasing food. And maybe they'll think back to their days at PS118 and say, hey, I know where that food comes from. It comes from the soil. So thank you very much. I look forward to hearing all your questions. <laughs>